Hello everyone, I think we're going live now, so please let me know if there are any AV or technical issues you notice. In fact, I'm going to make a note that please let me know if there are AV or technical issues. Um, I'll get started here in just a moment. This is a video that I've been wanting to... Oh, sharks. No, no. Oh, good. We're okay. We're okay. Sorry. False alarm. I'm still pretty, pretty new to this. So the point of this video is to talk about a really groundbreaking book. Let me turn off the air conditioning, actually. Um, a really groundbreaking book, one that kind of in this, the world of officers, of corporate um, and executives and people who are just trying to gain power, trying to gain power, whether that's political or corporate power, or perhaps wealth or friendships or influence. Uh, Robert Greene's book, The 48 Laws of Power, has been hugely influential. However, the problem with it that I found is that even though it's incredibly useful, the downside is just that so much of what it prescribes is amoral or sometimes downright unethical or even sometimes worded in a way that could come across as contemptuous. So I'm a big fan of this book, I'm a big fan of the author, but I thought it might be useful to make a video here where I'm um, doing this live, but then I'm going to save it and put it on YouTube as well. So if you're watching from YouTube, I appreciate that also. But I'd like to go through and walk through each of the 48 Laws of Power and give my take on how it's useful and how it can be applied honestly and ethically for win-win situations. I think this is important because the book was written in a way that kind of throws morality and honesty issues out the window and effectively says, do what you need to do to get power. That's what's most important. But many of us who are even fans of the book will find we feel that's not the most important thing. It's more important to be honest than to be successful. It's more important to be a good and compassionate person than it is to be the most popular person. So, in as many cases as possible, it's nice to be able to have both, of course. So what I'll do is I'm going to walk through each of these and I'll have some commentary from what I read of the book as well, because I did read the book, which means that these titles, these laws, sometimes have slightly misleading titles. If you actually read the chapter, and there's a chapter for each of the 48 laws of power, then you kind of discover, okay, that's not exactly what I meant necessarily. Uh, so 48 laws of power. It's an ambitious book about ambition, and it's a book that's meant to be more Machiavellian than Machiavelli himself. Just amoral, house of cards. Do what you need to do in order to succeed. Do what you need to do to rise to the top and have as much power as you can. So with that comes a lot of concern about ethics and morality and um, a moral vacuum. So I want to take each of these and for the ones where I can think of one, try to find and describe an accurate way it could, be it, it could be prescribed, it could be used. Uh, so, we'll just do them in order. Uh, the first one is never outshine the master. So the idea is that there's some implication here of don't overly talk back to the master, even if you think you have a better idea usually. Don't uh, try and, um, you know, be a, a problem child for the master. And the master could be boss or supervisor or CEO or, or any of these things. And that's a really, really important one. But I think one of the main things that they're trying to do is say, don't be better than the master because they will become threatened. They'll want to get rid of you. If you come on board as a junior position and the senior position who hired you is much, much worse, they may feel threatened and fire you because you know, they don't see, they see you as a threat. Uh, I think this can be applied ethically. I think you can still do your best and do your darndest and essentially try to contribute as much as possible, but you can do it in a way that you don't have to cast light on your supervisor in a way that causes shadow. Instead, I feel more that you can Find a way to make it win-win. Give your supervisor, your boss, your master, 
whatever you want to call that person, give them a way to also feel that they can take credit for your talent, your skills, your hard work. Um, not to take away credit from yourself, but just so that they never feel like you're trying to show them up. Um, and again, the idea is that all of these laws of power are very important and very useful, but they shouldn't be called laws of power in my book. I don't think they should be. I think they should be called 48 techniques of power because it's clear that some seem to contradict each other. And then if you read into the chapters, it turns out they don't, not really. But others just do definitely seem to uh, overlap or contradict each other. And I think that lends itself better to what's also said in the book, which is basically think of these as tactics, as techniques. I'm paraphrasing, but think of these as things you can do, not as a law that's hard and fast to always do. They're just tools for your arsenal, depending on your context and your situation. So, all that preamble being said, and uh, where does it show me how far, how far in I am? I guess it doesn't, oh, there we go, six minutes, all right, so it's a good time to get started, so uh, beyond the first one, never outshine the master, that's number one. I think there's a lot of intuitive, obvious ways that this could be done honestly, unethically. Um, for instance, if nothing else, it can mean don't go around your boss's back in a way that might offend them because they might in turn, you know, reprimand or reciprocate or just have bitter feelings about you. And so much about power and gaining power is about not leaving a trail in your wake of people who resent or dislike you. You want to be the person who's on people's side. So that's really important. All right, so number two. Never put too much trust in friends. Learn how to use enemies. So this is just an incredibly cynical position. And the chapter actually makes a really compelling series of points for why this is true. But I think there's a few reasons how it can be thought of in a more honest way and how it certainly can be done ethically. So for example, oftentimes we're more late to something our friends are going to because we kind of take it for granted that they're our friends or because we're close with them we're more easy to forgive them or they're more easy to forgive us. It's easier for people to be complacent with friendships or to even betray a friendship because they, you know, sin of complacency, they think they'll still be able to redeem it or otherwise heal that relationship. Whereas an enemy, especially an enemy who recently became an ally, but you have the tension of formerly being enemies, that is one of the most wild situations because they have everything to prove and so do you which means that your chances of contracts verbal or otherwise or any kind of collaboration is all that much more likely to be effective so number three conceal your intentions now this one sounds particularly cynical this one sounds particularly um, you know sneaky like hold your cards close to the chest and transparency is good. It's nice when people can know what you're thinking and what you're feeling. But there are reasons that I've learned to hold back in how much you say. Still never lie and still never, um, you know, hold back information that would be appropriate to say given questions or given context from other people. But in general, most people, including myself, as demonstrated through videos like this, most people talk too much in terms of self-disclosure. I do it all the time. I'm doing it right now. We do it. We love talking about ourselves, our interests, what we like, what we don't like, what we want to, are intending to do later in the week, in the weekend, our hopes and dreams. We love telling people these things. And even people who say, oh, I don't love telling people these things. Ask other people who are close to you. And they'll tell you, no, you, maybe you don't notice it, but you... You like telling people these things. So I say keep cards close to the chest is in part a way of being humble. You can apply it in a way of being humble, of saying the stuff that I'm interested in and the stuff that I'm passionate about or want to talk about endlessly or want to unload, other people don't necessarily want to unload. And furthermore, if I tell everyone my intentions about everything, then I've committed to tensions in people's minds that otherwise they may not hold me to. So, yeah, there's something for less, less is more. And um, 
to conceal your intentions in that way. But I would say to, to ethically apply this, don't do it in a way that's going to mislead people, especially in a way that could harm them. Don't do it in a way that you're preparing for some kind of vindictive strike. I say that's the part where you get rid of all that and you just instead focus on being a man or woman of fewer words. Now, maybe not few words, but fewer than they used to be. That's a big challenge for me. I need to work on that. Um, but I think it's helpful. It also makes it easier for other people to actively listening to what actively listen to what you're saying. And part of the reason for that is simply that you're saying fewer words. It's easier to process. You're being more humble because you're not asking the listener to absorb and process as much. It's easier for you to say because you don't have to reprocess it. You've already processed it. It's your info. And it feels like it should be very, very interesting to everyone else that you went on a hunting trip this last weekend. And that's so exciting. People are going to find this really interesting. But they won't because unless they really are into that or they're into hunting or they're into hearing someone else's anecdotes, by and large, they don't want more than a passing sentence about how your weekend went, usually. Another thing to point out is that for all of these, any of these, there are exceptions for all of them. And the book, The 48 Laws of Power, makes that clear also. Number four, this is completely related. So always say less than is necessary. That's very much a loaded thing to say, but there's a lot of things that can come from it that are useful and could help other people. So if you... Again, don't overload people with too much information, with too many words. You can effectively find a way to make it so that it's easier for them. They can focus on what's important. Furthermore, just psychologically and socially, they've discovered that people trust other people more, or they find them to be more worth taking serious or reasonable or wise if they just, they're talking less. This one's a hard one for me to do because I talk so much clearly but it could be worth it. And it lends itself to concealing your intentions. Um, we've all heard people who just kind of tell you their motivations and their goals and their plans. Like, wow, how was your morning so far? Well, I'll tell you about mine tonight. I'm going to go to far the CVS pharmacy and I'm going to pick up this. That should be nice and I'll get a movie. So I'm really excited about that. It's fun for me to think about. Blah, blah, blah. It's fun for that person to say out loud. No doubt. But to everyone else, it is just not a fun thing it, 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 they don't enjoy it so that is the one about saying less than is necessary uh so and that's a huge thing for me i'm really trying to work on that a lot because again repetitive thinking loquacious overly wordy um that's what i uh, that's what i want to work on there number five so much depends on reputation guard it with your life so this is just on its face true the chapter goes into detail about why it's true but it, it couldn't be more true and the best way to guard your reputation i feel is to just be honest and not do bad stuff if you don't wrong people it's an easier way to guard your reputation the other way you can hurt your reputation is just by lacking any sense of tact or social skills so i think this might be one of the most important ones. You can't completely pr protect your reputation and also do shady stuff. Sooner or later, it's going to come back to bite you. Um, number six, court attention at all costs. This is an example of one that seems to contradict another one. The chapter is what gives it context, and in a way, I would recommend reading that chapter if you read nothing else, but also realizing that the courting attention at all costs doesn't just always mean be a show off, make a spectacle, have everyone look at you. Sometimes it means that and it can be a technique that's useful in certain party situations, certain business or sales situations. But um, for the most part, if you just had that switched on all the time, that would be that would be bad. That would hurt you. That would hurt your power, your influence, your standing. Uh, so Instead, it should be taken as a way to say, okay, how can I always make myself seem distinct? How can I have a unique style so that I'm not just another face in the crowd? How can I show my value um, 
so that people want to listen. And yeah, um, just broadly, how can I have a good sense of marketing and networking and connection that I'm coordinating and contacting lots of people and collaborating with a lot of people? Um, number seven, get others to do the work for you, but always take the credit. So this is one that's just clearly, completely amoral, possibly downright immoral, because this is the kind of behavior we hate when people do it to us. When they say, oh, I did all these great things, but actually you're the one who did most of it. This is one where I really don't even know if there's an ethical application. Even if it does help you to do that because, oh, you save time, someone else has to do it, and you piggyback off that success by taking credit. I think this is the kind of thing that I would critique the book about and say, this will come back to bite you. Any ethical application I can think of would really just be in the context of saying, how can I collaborate in a way that I'll benefit from their success and their knowledge, but still also share credit through our collaboration, through our work together? Number eight, make other people come to you use bait if necessary. So I have kind of forget some of the context and details for why this one is recommended as a law or a technique or tactic, whatever you want to call it. The title here clearly calls them laws. I think it's something to be said about establishing your authority, your value. The person who has to always go to the other person is often less authoritative. They have less weight, less gravity, and less pull. If you make it so that people must come to you, not only does it show you have that authority, but it also gives you confidence and you have home field advantage. I think there are ways to do this that's still ethical, but I think the main way to make sure it's ethical is to just make sure that all parties are comfortable with it. Um, and this also is one that really applies to, to dating as well. I mean, we've all seen it with both men and women, and we've often done it. Uh, we chase too much and too hard, and the other person would chase, but they feel a little bit pulling back. Sometimes the best way to attract other people is to just make yourself more attractive in any ways you can, perhaps learning new skills or gaining, you know, uh, increased social skills and suave and so forth. But uh, ultimately, um, uh, home field advantage is good, but... Uh, I don't think you have to always bait people. And it could be an honest bait. It could be saying something like, okay, uh, I want to get all my friends to come over to this party. I'll invite them all by telling them I brought their favorite snacks and telling them that all these other people are invited too. So they can expect a lot of people to, they can expect a lot of people to, to watch or to come. Number eight, uh, or number nine, win through actions never through argument. This one is easy to apply ethically because the reason is um, people push back when you disagree with them. We're told and we're advised that really there shouldn't be pushback. Everyone should just be okay when there's a disagreement, talk through it casually. But they do know that all other things being equal, most people the most of the time will like you a little bit less even if only momentarily, but they'll like you a little bit less if you disagree with them, if you tell them they're wrong. There's subtle and more tactful ways of telling them they're wrong, starting with emphasizing what you agree on or how you can see it from their perspective. But ultimately, if you can show that your idea works better, and then don't gloat it, don't throw it in their face, just kind of casually show, okay, let's see how my idea works. Uh, then sympathize with them afterwards. So show empathy by saying, I see why you wanted to do it your way. I think that's it. I think, you be, I think you can't really convince people. I think you can't really get them to agree with you by words because they just dig in their heels. That's what people do. They have a sense of pride, a sense of intellectual vanity, a sense of feeling like if you're rejected, if your ideas are rejected, that person is disrespecting you on some level or rejecting you or dismissing you. It's very hard for someone to be just told outright, I completely disagree with this thing that's important to you and not feel in some way 
dismissed, even if there was no nicer way of saying it. Alright, number 10. Infection. Avoid the unhappy and the unlucky. So people who are in rough situations, people who need a lot of help and attention, maybe they have mental illness, maybe they're just... Bad luck seems to follow them, either from happenstance or their own pattern of behavior and their pattern of networking and friends and so forth. I think you it's good to abandon this one. I think this is an example of one where it will help you become more powerful if you're just always surrounding yourself with people who are positive, can do success, and have a track record for success. I do believe it does rub off on you in many ways, and it helps propel you as well. But I don't think it's worth it for what I believe is the moral failing of just shooing away. Is this where I do it? Yeah, shooing away. <laughs> no, oh, I, oh, it's over here. Okay. Shooing away um, anyone who is in a rough spot just so you don't catch their negative energy. What I would say is more useful is to instead focus on not absorbing negative energy from people who have it. But don't kick out everyone who has negative energy because oftentimes they have that because they're in pain and they're suffering. And if we reject everyone out of our life who's suffering, well, then what's the point of having all that power if we're just kind of scummy about how we got it? <clears throat> in fact, that sentiment I just said is a big impetus for wanting to make this video. Excuse me as I drink water. Um, but there is something also that you can apply by, ba by saying emulate the people who are happy and lucky because the people who are happy and lucky a lot of times it's chance but a lot of times it's because they're happy they're positive they're flexible they're adaptable they have high energy they have a can-do spirit they get back up when they're knocked down it's good to emulate those people so to that extent I agree with him 11. Learn to keep people dependent on you. Well, this could be applied very unethically, like, like a withholding situation, or someone needs you for food, therefore you exploit them. Don't do that. That's not ethical. That's not good. Same with bribery. It's not good. Instead, do such a good job of what you do. Get so passionate and excited about your day job, your hobbies, anything where you're collaborating with other people, and use that so that they really need you around, you're indispensable. And that indispensability gives you more power. So I think that's really useful. Number 12. Use selective honesty and de generosity to disarm your victim. That's literally how it's written. Disarm your victim. The idea is it's like marks or targets that we're going to scam or take advantage of. Just don't do that, I think. There's no ethical application of that. The only thing that's close to a way to really apply that is to say um, uh, that if you reveal more about yourself at the opportune time and if you are willing to be completely honest with admitting your mistakes and admitting your faults, you will gain credibility because people will say this person they, they're someone I can trust and it does give you power, it gives you influence that way. Number 13. When asking for help, appeal to people's self-interest, never to their mercy or gratitude. Well, I don't know if this is more ethical or less ethical to do it to their self-interest rather than their mercy or gratitude. But I would say, yeah, this one I just completely agree with. It's just true. If you try to sell someone something on the basis that you think they'll need it and they they might very well need it and you compare that to trying to sell something to someone on the basis that five percent will go to charity obviously obviously it depends on the person but the first one i believe is much more likely to get the sale if you appeal to saying oh like let's do this deal this collaboration this team this project this idea if you start by saying how it will help them, because people actually just aren't that interested in how something will help you. Like, please help me with this because it will help me a lot. 
sometimes you have to say that because it's just true. But if you can ever say, please just help me with this, and I think it will help both of us because you'll also get a chance to research deeper into some of these things. If you can make it a win-win, that's better. Number 14, pose as a friend, work as a spy. I don't, I don't know what to say about this one because the idea of pretending to be a friend but you're actually spying on them, there's no direct ethical application of that, I think. It's just shady and skeevy and, and dishonest. But what I will say is that I think you can gain benefits of networking and having friends because of the fact that they know things and they know people which means that they can connect you with other people and the people they know and this friend can give you information about what's going on they can give you reconnaissance so instead of saying pose as a scot by work as a friend i would say use your friends for reconnaissance and information that could be useful So, um, number 15, crush your enemies totally. So this is just based on Machiavelli's idea of saying, when you have the enemy, either completely destroy them or treat them very, very, very well. Because if they're destroyed, then they have no recourse, no way of firing back. And if you treat them well, then they don't want to fire back. But if you injure them and let them recover, they will come back for vengeance. I don't know how to apply this ethically too much, except for saying that you can do something completely without half measures. Like if you need to um, protest something or put in a complaint or reject something, you're really going to, you're going to be better off if you do it completely, if you just kind of halfway do something. And I think this is also can be true for just not being complacent in general, like if you're playing a sports game, even if you're winning, win harder, because it could all bounce back against you. Um, and, or if you do have a situation where you need to compete with someone and beat them, whether in sales or marketing or this or anything else doing it completely in a way that they don't want to have that fist fight again so to speak that's really what you want it's not enough to fight off someone figuratively metaphorically you, you have to completely um, solidify the victory but the ethics of that all just comes down to what you think is an ethical battle to fight and that does come down to your judgment to some extent. Number 16. Use absence to increase respect and honor. This one's tricky because we do find that we grow more familiar and happy with people who are around us a lot. We like people we're familiar with more than strangers, even if we don't like them that much. But there is value in this in saying how giving people a pause or a break of exposing themselves to you and your ideas can give them more time to reflect, more time to let a moment land where they absorb things you've recently said to them or events you've recently had. Sometimes a pause or a beat in a conversation is the best way to strengthen it. Um, and also there's something to be said for not being too available. You know, they talk about it in dating how if you leave yourself so available that your schedule is so open that another person will just always, anytime they ask you for a date, you would always be available. Well, both men, and I, th I believe especially women, but I could be wrong with that, but both men and women kind of hold that in contempt because that person is just, they're not doing anything. They're not busy, they're not popular, and they're always willing to bend over backwards for me. And the person often loses all sense of attraction because this person is just kind of, contemptuous they're, or they're below they're, they're not that valuable there's no sense of scarcity so some absence and genuine absence don't just pretend to be busy actually be actively involved with, with things that'll help you or help others 
Number 17. Keep others in suspended terror. Cultivate an error of unpredictability. Well, in some realms of politics, this may be useful. And in sports, this may be very useful. And in driving up excitement in dating and romance. This can be useful if it's done in a positive, non-threatening, non-harmful way. However, I don't think that this attitude is good for the workplace. I just don't. There's just too many problems with it. I think the ethical way to apply it is if you do it in a wholesome, positive way, and just in the context of something like art and making art of any kind, and also in the realm of dating. But keep it honest. Number 18. Do not build fortresses to protect yourself. Isolation is dangerous. This is just plain on its face. This is already ethical to apply. There's nothing, there's no misgivings or uh, compunction I have about just recommending this. People often think, oh, the world is so crappy. There's so many enemies. There's so many people who dislike me. I think that I should just more or less give up on the world and isolate myself. At first, it may feel better and you may have less to worry about as far as dealing with the crap people will give you. But it's not worth it. Sooner or later, having that lack of social safety net, that lack of connection, and that lack of input coming in from others will affect you, and negatively, I think. Number 19. Know who you're dealing with. Do not offend the wrong person. This also certainly relates to say less than is necessary. The more you say, the more chances you have to offend someone. And when we say offense, we don't just mean in the, you know, like, oh, those SJWs, they get offended by everything. I mean, anytime you do something to another person or have some behavior or thing you say that bothers another person or annoys them, that counts as offense. They're offended. They may call it, I'm not offended, I'm annoyed. But annoyed is also offended if it's coming from, like, a friend or a colleague or whoever. Uh... So yeah, it's just important to have a sense of tact, to have a sense of well, how can I appeal to this person still being honest, but how can I how can I not step on their toes? Number 20, do not commit to anyone. And I think this is another title where the title of this chapter is and therefore the title of this law is exaggeratory. I think it's hyperbolic. I think there are many cases where you do want to predict I think, uh, uh, commit. There's many cases where you want to sign a contract, where you want to get involved for the long term, where you want to take on a new obligation. But I agree with the premise that all things being equal, your default should be to not do that. Because along with commitment of some kind, hey, do you want to start cleaning the park every Sunday? That's a beautiful commitment to do, and that's a good thing to do. But if you set it up as a commitment that you'll do it every Sunday... If you change your mind about being interested in that, or you just have too many Sundays you're not available, it's going to cause problems for you and for the other person, the other the volunteer group. Instead, it's better to still be involved, but with less built-in commitment. That way, you're able to. That way, you're still able to be flexible, to change your mind, or to decide if it's right for you. And to not disappoint people because you didn't sign up for it. But yeah, I wouldn't say never commit to anyone. Number 21. Play a sucker to catch a sucker. Seem dumber than your mark. <laughs> the red flag with the phrasing of mark right there. But there is something to be said for expressing some level of naivete. Sometimes you can get more passionate information about someone, how they describe what they are interested in if you if you don't reveal how knowledgeable you are and i think that this law can be applied ethically if you just dial it back if instead of saying cat play a sucker to catch a sucker and so forth instead just say you don't need to tell everyone how smart you are if someone tells you a couple new things and one of them already you, you already knew it's better to focus on saying, oh, that new one, I didn't know about that, it's really interesting, than it is to, to point out, ah, I already knew that. I already knew that. People hate other people telling them things they already know, yes, but even more, people hate 
when someone else says, oh, don't tell me that because I already knew it. So sometimes it's good to not emphasize how much you know. Sometimes it's good to just be calm and that can make you more humble because then you can realize, oh, I knew less than I thought. Number 22, use the surrender tactic, transform weakness into power. So the idea here is that it's never smart to fight unto the last man, so to speak. It's never smart to have an all-in battle with someone politically or in the workplace or even a relationship. A lot of times simply giving in and indulging the other person and effectively surrendering is the best way to gain power because it gives you more credit, more credibility. It shows your openness, your flexibility. It takes the radar, the target off your back as someone who's who's a problem, who's disagreeable. And so they stop worrying about you. They stop thinking about you. You fly more under the radar in that way. Uh, so there's definitely room there. And also just the uh, emphasis on not having pride. Like if someone disagrees with you and they tell you how you're wrong and then it seems like they probably might be right but you're still annoyed with them for pointing out that you were wrong then it's still worthwhile to to just kind of surrender and, and admit your mistake or admit that you were defeated and it also lends itself to being a gracious winner as well uh, I want to emphasize now at this point that even though these are all these are all ways to apply these ethically and I'm using commentary based on the chapters as I read them and as I remember them. This is still my twist on it. This is my variation. This is my variant where I've slightly slightly tweaked the, the purpose um, or, or application of any of these. Probably against what the author probably intended. Number 24. Play the perfect courtier. So I think it's hard to do this without sounding fake, but if you genuinely can greet people with a friendly, confident, warm, enthusiastic smile, if you can be complimentary while still being authentic, if you can be someone who is sensitive and understanding, just a generally a people being a people pleaser, people think that, that pushes you back, but really it does get you ahead. People like people who please them, who make them feel better about themselves, who are flexible and easy to talk with. So just gaining social skills in general is so important. Number 25, recreate yourself. This one is interesting, and I forget a lot of what the chapter says to contextualize this or to clarify, but there is personal branding in everything. Everything you do is personal branding. Every behavior you do, every attitude you have and express every outfit you wear is part of that branding you don't have to be stuck with the aesthetic or the mentality or even the demeanor that you've had for years people will always say don't change your personality you shouldn't have to change your personality just have self-development but a lot of times it's the same thing a lot of times self-development involves i hate to say it fundamental tweaks to your personality you're still the same person but you've made more conscious choices about the kind of person you want to be, whether it's style and aesthetics or whether it's about just how you handle something or how you psychiatrically, psychologically decide to and take something in. So being not afraid to change, to self-develop, to transform, um, that's, that's applicable in an ethical way. Number 26, keep your hands clean. This is also related to the one about reputation, but more or less it means that if, you're, if there's dirty work to be done or something shady to be done, the book says make someone else do it for you and so you have, you know, benefit of the doubt, etc. But really I would say just keep your hands clean by not doing dirty stuff to begin with. Just keep your hands clean by showing that you have integrity, that you're not up to shady stuff and that gives true power numbers 27 play on people's need to believe to create a cult following 
Well, we took a wild left turn here by saying, oh, make a cult. No, all right, don't make a cult. Don't make a cult. Cults are silly. Don't do it. Um, but you can play on people's hopes and dreams in a positive way by appealing to them and saying, this thing or this attitude or this product or whatever it is can help you reach for this dream or if you're trying to persuade them to do a different behavior. This behavior change can help bring you up so that you have a a more position, a better position towards achieving your goal. Uh, so this is where you appeal to people's desires, their dreams, their goals. And it shows that active listening because you show that you're interested in those things and how and you're relating other things back to what they care about, which is their dreams, their goals, their wants, their deepest desires. Number 30, keep your accomplishments effortless, uh, or at least so they seem that way. When you do a lot of hard work and you say, gosh, boss, that was so much hard work. It took me two hours longer than expected. I worked so hard on that. I don't know if I can ever do it again. That was really hard. Now, again, you don't want to be dishonest, but it's good to not emphasize that because it doesn't actually increase your power or standing. It just shows you as being more fragile, more vulnerable, and a little bit more self-pitying. I've been guilty of this so many times, but many times the most attractive, charismatic, empowering thing you can do after you achieve something great or perform some task is to kind of just have a no sweat mentality. Doing that is also better for your confidence because if you get into the groove and the mindset of thinking, oh, no sweat, then it becomes easier in your mind and you get better at it the next time more quickly because you haven't built it up as this incredibly hard project. Number 31, control the options. Get others to play with the cards you deal. This one you can sometimes just do outright without being dishonest about it at all. And that's what I would recommend. So an example might be, hey, we both can't decide where we want to go out to eat tonight. And we have different kind of preferences, but we're not sure. How about if I give you a list of three ones or four ones that I'm thinking about for restaurants, and you pick your favorite of those four. That way, I pick the choices, but you pick the final choice, so we both had a choice in it. That would be an example of that. Um, another example is just a more shady or obtuse one of saying, all right, you're going to buy a car here at the dealership. Do you want a black one or a gray one? And it all starts with the presupposition that this model of car they were going to buy. And I think that's a little bit more dodgy. And maybe there's some context where that's both ethical, moral, and also wise. But I think in many cases, it's better to be just upfront about using that tactic and just transparent. Number 33, discover each man's thumbscrew. So this basically means look into the weaknesses of other people and see how you can use it against them. Now this is just completely morally vacuous. Unless it's done in an honest way, like if your competitor, if their product that they're selling at their company has a weakness, using it against them and saying, hey, they have this weakness, that's not shady or skeevy, that's part of the competition. However, if a personal or an individual has some kind of problem like they have a struggle with alcohol addiction. Using that against them or trying to use that against them to enrich yourself and better yourself, not for, not for your sake of other people, but to enrich yourself, that is where I would just say jettison that one. Number 32. This one relates to that whole cult-like following thing. Play to people's fantasies. Um, so in 27, you give them a reason to believe, you give them an ideal, a mission, a philosophy, even if it's just a sales team, you give them this is the mission we're believing in, to hit this sales goal, and what it'll mean for you and the department. But with this one, it's more specific uh, to saying, um, yeah, to say what do you truly want. Let's find a way to make this go toward what you truly want so that's what I think that's really special 
Number 34. Be royal in your own fashion. Act like a king to be treated like one. This is probably my favorite. Beca and again, people will often say that any kind of change, any kind of conscious change in your demeanor or behavior is inauthentic. And I really don't think that's true. I think it can be. But if you make a conscious decision, I want to stop saying this kind of greeting out of habit. And instead, I want to greet people this way. Or I want to have better posture, so I'm going to resist my natural instinct to slouch and hold myself up with some dignity. I may not be the best at my job yet, but I'm going to take myself and my sense of work and achievement seriously. Having that confidence that comes from respecting yourself as though you were in the noble court, that can affect everything in a lot of positive ways. Number 35, master the art of timing. So this one's just useful to think about for everything, that many tactics when used will only make sense in certain timings. Many of these laws will only make sense in certain timings. And therefore, figuring out when to make the move. And also, you, this applies to saying just schedule things out. Realize how long you have to do something, how much it matters to you, how to schedule out your time, and how to be early when it helps to be early, how to be late when it helps to be late, and how to say the right thing at the right moment. Practice makes perfect, but just understanding that it's not as simple as saying all the right things and doing all the right things. It's doing and saying the right things at the right moment. Number 36. Disdain things you cannot have. Ignoring them is the best revenge. So this one can apply to a lot of things. Let's say you didn't get hired for a job you wanted. Well, you could be all vindictive and tell everyone how terrible that company is and write up um, in Glassdoor and everywhere else how they're horrible and they didn't hire you and they're idiots. But this only hurts them and it hurts you, but it doesn't improve the situation. And by disdain, we mean contempt in this case. We don't mean like hatefully. We just mean think of it as it's below you. It's beneath you. It's not worth thinking about. If you ask someone out on a date and they're not interested, that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with them. It doesn't mean that they're bad or anything. And it doesn't mean that you have something wrong with you necessarily. But it does mean the best course of action is to move on and say, I'm not going to worry about that anymore. I'm not going to keep going for it. I am going to have self-respect and not think about it. If that thing, person, company, or whatever doesn't want me or doesn't want me to join, then they're not worth it. They're not worth my time. They don't have the realization to understand how valuable contributions I can make. So simply ignoring those things that reject you or don't want you or that you can't have I really want that great, great car. You'll, if, if you've decided you're never going to get that car and it wouldn't be good for you, just don't think about it. And when you do think about it, dismiss the thought. Number 37, create compelling spectacles. So this one is the one that seems like it goes completely against, you know, sticking in and assimilating and everything. But by creating compelling spectacles, I think really the way to apply that is to say, there are certain times, whether you're giving a PowerPoint presentation or if you are uh, going on a first date or if you're in some way showing off your skills playing the piano, if you can do something that captures people's attention, even if it's in a subtle way and it's just smart, interesting, elegant word choices, if you can do that, it's important to be memorable. It's important to catch people's attention if you want power. Now, you can do this without getting all up in their face, which I think would be unethical, or being annoying about it, or per per persistent, or gaudy, or inauthentic. But if you say, like, hey, I know martial arts and kung fu. Anyone want to see me go on stage and do my routine as part of the talent show? There's nothing wrong with that. Not only could that increase your power but it could raise your confidence and it could increase your network of people who respect you and admire you. So that's a great one as well. 
Number 38 is the one that really seems to um, contradict it. And this one, I think the title was written incorrectly. It says, think as you want, but behave like others. Well, that seems to contradict how we heard, um, you know, make sure you create a spectacle, behave like others. And this also seems to go against the whole thing of saying, um, what do we say, uh, you know, be, show, don't fe be forgotten. Yeah, basically, yeah, creating compelling spectacles. What this really means, um, um, Oh, hey, thanks for joining us. Um, what this really means is saying that if you have unpopular beliefs, it's actually the beliefs that are you want to keep close to the chest. It only makes this clear when you read the entire chapter, and I think to some extent it's true. Depending on your values and depending on how important it is to you, it may be worth it to... Um, to just spill it all anyway. But ultimately, if you can kind of in some way show or demonstrate, hey, I think like you, I feel like you, I'm on the same page as you, I'm not a different weirdo, like I don't have weird beliefs, like I don't believe dogs should be able to vote, for example. And uh, Robert Green kind of advises that if you do believe dogs should vote, effectively, the end result would be saying just don't tell people that don't you know blend in in the sense of pretending you share their beliefs is how i think this means but i don't think it means never create spectacles or never do anything to you know be royal or otherwise uh, otherwise have a presence number 39 stir up waters to catch fish this one I'm pretty puzzled with because I don't really know a lot of ethical ways to apply it. Basically, if you cause some chaos, if you put people through the ringer, if you in some way create some discord, then weaker people can be purged out or used or exploited. But I don't think that's ethical at all. I would say the only thing that's useful here is just to say that mixing things up um, oh, I like that about dogs voting. <laughs> the only ethical thing there is to say basically that mixing things up or shaking things up, if you're a manager, moving desks around in order to see if it motivates people with a fresh atmosphere, that's the aspect of this that I think can be applied. Number 40. Despise the free lunch. So... This one I like a lot, how, you know, it's just a free, t you know, trial. It's a free one-time only pass. It's, you know there's more coming. But it's not just with products. It's also with people. In many cases, people will do favors for you that seem to be free. They seem to not come at a cost. But on some level, they will still feel that you owe them. And it will put you in their debt and therefore it will make it more awkward. Whenever possible, it's useful to, uh, it's useful to basically say, okay, how can I make this up to the person right away? Or how can I make it even Steven if I really need to borrow a favor from someone? Say it's helping me move or helping with some project or whatever. Because people ultimately will resent if you don't reciprocate, even if it seemed to be a free gift or free support. Uh, thanks for wonderful compliments from Eric in the messages here. Again, oh, that's my cat. Again, we're recording this live, but the idea is that this will be saved as a saved live video that we'll put on YouTube and possibly keep on Facebook Live as well. Uh, so yeah, just watching out for free stuff because they're not really free. And sometimes it's still worth it to take them, but just realizing that things are much more transactional and reciprocation-based than we would like to imagine. The next one up is to is 41. 
avoid stepping into a great person's shoes. And I think the, the reason for this is just relatively, um, uh, relatively straightforward. You, just, you will be compared to them. And if they're great, you'll be compared unfavorably. Because even if you get as great as them, your ramp up time, you'll be worse. And they'll always remember that ramp up time. Whenever possible, if you can avoid stepping into the shoes of someone, then uh, that, that's been truly great. You're less likely to put a target on your back in politics, in the office, everywhere else. It's a dangerous thing to do. Oh, thanks again so much for uh, great compliments, my friend Eric, in the comments. Uh, so glad to have you uh, here. Number 42, strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. Well, what the F does that mean if not taken in the most direct way of saying, kill the leader? Because we're not killing people. I hope we're not. I hope you're not. I'm certainly not. So we don't want to just kill the leader. But sometimes it means, I think the way to best apply this is to say, address the heart of the problem. If there are symptoms, if there are issues... Find the ultimate source of them and target that. It may not be a person that's the leading problem. Maybe it's a computer virus and the other problems are coming from that computer virus. It's find the source of the problem and hit that first rather than thinking about all the peripheral elements of it. Number 43, work on the hearts and minds of the others. So this relates to playing the perfect courtier. In fact, I think there could have been fewer overall loss. Some of these could have been combined. But I think this one is as honest or ethical as you make it. If you do it through deception, through subterfuge, through trickery, it's not going to be good for anyone, including you ultimately. But if you play to the hearts and minds of others by inspiring them, by setting a good example, by showing that you can actively listen to them, then you can become more powerful because you're more influential. And by being more influential, you gain strength, which you can use to in turn help yourself and help others. So that's a win-win if you apply it in an honest way. Number 44, disarm and infuriate with the mirror effect. So this kind of can be thought of like chess a little bit. If someone moves this pawn, you move that. If someone does this doing exactly the same thing back that the first person does. And I don't even remember how literally this was meant in the book. I don't think they actually meant like changing physical posture and positions based on, based on what your enemy did. But I do think there's room for, to twist this a little bit to more just generally having a sense of adaptability so that you assimilate to the conversation style of the person you're interacting with, whether they're an enemy or a friend, in a way that you show an interest in coming from their point of view. Um, if you reflect back to them what they said and even show where you agree with it, even if ultimately the whole of it you don't agree, that can be powerful because sometimes it helps them see the holes in their own topics. But don't use it for some kind of tricky backstabbing thing. I think that's not wise morally or pragmatically. Number 45. Preach the need for change, but never reform too quickly. This one is just so interesting, and it's completely true. People don't want to hear that nothing should change. They don't like that, because that's irritating, that's not seen as visionary, it's not seen as clever, and it's not inspiring. There's not really much inspiring about change, nothing, because um, no one's completely content with how things are right now. Yet, paradoxically, people are com totally upset by large changes. So small, modest, incremental changes, whether it's the policy or behavior or approach or style, that can really be a lot more friendly and accessible to people. Number six, never appear too perfect. Admit when you make mistakes. Show that you can be a person who trips. Don't be afraid to admit when you're wrong. 
don't be afraid to say, I don't know the answer to that. Even if it's something obvious that you feel like everyone knows the answer. Like, where's Portugal? Well, everyone knows where Portugal is. Well, maybe for whatever reason you don't. If you are just completely open and sincere and just kind of laugh about it even, this is something that Jennifer Lawrence is really great at. She's very open, but in a fun, non-depressing way about expressing what she is weak about or flawed with, but without sounding self-pitying or morose or sad. Um... Do not go past the mark you aimed for. In victory, learn when to stop. So this is really something where this affects, um, you know, gambling, for example. Oh, you got the jackpot. Well, if you keep gambling, you could get even more. Yeah, you'd lose it all also. Um, why does every empire fall? Like, um, you know, he said in that movie, he uh, said in the, in the movie, Limitless. It's just human nature to overreach. Ah, oh, we got all this and this and this in our empire. Let's go ahead and get more. Sometimes stop when you were successful. Sometimes say, this is enough. Because that's how you avoid losing everything sometimes. Like many board games like Risk, it's spreading too thin that makes you lose everything. Go for the mark you aimed for, and even if you got it with tremendous success, be careful before you bite off a whole lot more, or it will come back to bite you. Number 48. Assume formlessness. Reiterating a little bit of what I said earlier. Assume the power to adapt and assimilate and realize that each of these laws can be applied differently in different situations, but they shouldn't always be applied. Many times, these tactics or laws are not appropriate in a given situation or just won't be useful, or will cause more harm than good, or have to only be applied in a certain way. Being able to adapt, to be flexible, to change your approach, and even change your demeanor, that is what assume formlessness is about. And as long as it's coming from an honest place, where you still have core values, maybe they're open-minded core values, but they're still core values, that, I think, is where you can have the best of both worlds. So I ran through it pretty quickly. We're just about an hour in, which is about how long I wanted it to be. It's the 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene, a book I highly recommended it. It's been a little while since I've read it. So if I mangled my explanation of any of what he was saying in his chapters, but note that each of these is a separate chapter. And sometimes the title of the chapter, the name of the law is different than how I would articulate it. Um, if I were saying it in more than a soundbite, in more than a sentence. But hopefully that a book like this, a great book that has these kind of Machiavellian teachings and ideas, will still be useful when applied honestly and ethically and transparently. Because gaining power is good when it gives us more security for ourselves, when it lets us help other people more, and when it lets us feel good about the accomplishments we've done. But if it's not done with integrity and for a good purpose and with an honest, good faith uh, sense of what it's there for, then power for power's sake is worthless. It's something that many politicians throughout all of history clearly never realized, many of them, that power for its own sake, without honesty, integrity, or just general goodness, is not valuable. Um, and I think that's the biggest flaw of the book is that it doesn't value virtue enough. And I think it, it should because I think um, even if saying virtue is not a priority helps you gain power more quickly, having virtue as a priority gives you more reason and rationale and justification for having the power to begin with. Anyway, that's all I wanted to mention about this topic. I've been meaning to make this for a while. I know the green screen's not perfect yet. All AV feedback is welcome because I haven't done this green screen thing in a while and the microphone's a little different, etc. But I really appreciate everyone coming, checking this out live. I appreciate anyone who came after the fact to 
uh, to watch it, to check it out. It should be saved on Facebook Live, and I'll have it uploaded to YouTube Live saved videos also. I'll see everyone else in the next time, you empowered people.